Hey everybody, welcome to this week's Q&A. Looks like all the questions are on Patreon, but I just wanted to let everybody know that this is for all the support services. So the YouTube join, I'm not sure how you're supposed to say that, join, subscribe, whatever. Uh, I'm on float plane and I, I'm considering a few others just to make it easier for other people. Uh, so I just wanted to let everybody know that, you know, the support service stuff will always kind of be changing and I always want to do whatever is easiest for everybody. I'm not trying to ask people to sign up for multiple things. I'm just trying to be on the platforms that the most people are on just to make it easier for all of you. So uh, I, when I was only on Patreon, I used to call this the Patreon Q&A, uh, but for the past couple of years, I've been on uh, multiple platforms, which is why it's the supporter Q and A. So uh, I don't know. I, maybe everybody already knows that, and this was just stupid rambling. But I wanted to let everybody know that you know I appreciate all of you so much, uh, even the ones that don't support. Thank you so much for watching the video and sharing it with your friends and stuff like that. It's it's absolutely awesome that I get to be a part of this. But let's jump in and check out the support questions this week, which just happened to only be on one platform. It looks like, but we'll see. KelbSYC said, suppose you have an early console that only has RF output and you want to connect it to a modern flat panel display. Although the recommended way to bridge the RF to composite gap is to find an old VCR, do you fear that the decline of working VCRs, or the need to import an out-of-region VCR for an out-of-region console, might make this untenable? If so, do you know of anyone working on an RF to HDMI converter suitable for retro gaming? Or do you feel that it would be more economical to mod the console and give it more modern outputs instead? All excellent questions. So the reason that RF converters were so cheap back in the day, so the ones built into every VCR, a lot of other weird devices had them. The reason is because of quantity. So they'd make them at, you know, 100,000 in a clip, and that way they would be so cheap. But to do that now from scratch, to build an RF modulator? demodulator, RF demodulator, um, and turn that into composite video and mono audio. To build that from scratch would actually be very expensive. And I don't think any many people in the community would spend, I'm going to guess and say, a hundred bucks minimum on something like that, just to then have to buy a scaler when you there are often very easy other options, right? NES has the composite port right on the side. Atari 2600 does not. But Atari 2600 has an RGB mod that might be cheaper. Well, it's definitely cheaper to install yourself than buying a brand new box. Um, but it also might even be cheaper to have it professionally installed, depending on uh, how much that hypothetical box would be. So I, I do completely understand the concern, but I think because VCRs are still so cheap and you could just find them for a few dollars at a goodwill still, um, I think that's going to be the solution for the near future. And then maybe somebody will swing back around and figure out a way to do it. Maybe there'll be a high-end gaming-based scaler that will also have an RF input because if you're spending... Like, once again, I'm just making this up here. But like if you spent a thousand bucks on a super pro high-end audiophile grade scaler, then yeah, maybe throw an RF jack in that just to... just you know, and a really good comb filter just to kind of make that part easier. But I think the goal of a lot of these hobby project, or I guess, you know, medium-sized projects like the retro tank stuff, the goal of it is to always make something that is balanced between performance and price. Because the bottom line is, if you are on a budget and you just want to connect your old Atari 2600 to a TV, getting a retro tank mini is very reasonable because it's not cheap, but anybody that takes just a few moments to see the difference between that and the $10 ones on Amazon will go, okay, I get it. Uh, but then having to spend a, no, a whole other cost on top of that, I think that would deter a lot of people. Whereas you could just, you know, grab your grandma's old VCR or something that she's got up in the attic and plug it in. So that's just my thoughts on it. I probably just kind of rambled a little too long, but I wanted to be clear about it because I thought it was a good question. And I think it's the whole RF demodulator thing d doesn't really make sense unless you know that. Because it's like, hey, why can't I just throw on another, you know, another chip to convert it, right? You could already do that for other stuff. And that's, that's the reason. So hopefully that was clear enough and, and not too rambly. Richard Webster has an interesting question. Um, it's a broken up into three parts because I guess the question kept getting deleted when he posted a long question, which maybe that's what's been happening with Patreon. Maybe they accidentally delete 
posts that are too long or something, or, or maybe they don't delete them, but they don't actually go through or something. I don't know. So if you have a long question, maybe break it up like Richard did. But the question is that when they have a bunch of their consoles connected to an Xtron VGA switch, uh, through a bunch of converters and everything else, the Xbox 360 sometimes takes a really long time to boot up, where if you just connected the Xbox 360 with a VGA cable directly in, it works fine, or if you go HDMI to VGA through a powered converter, it also works fine. It seems like the issue is when using an HDMI to VGA converter that's self-powered, that's the problem. And I think... That has to do with a combination of voltage on the HDMI signal, um, maybe voltage on the VGA pin, and even things like um, the boot time scanning to see what devices are connected. And I think that anytime you're in a situation like that, because it could be any of those things, just simply adding power to the converter would be a good idea. And uh, if you use a power strip to connect all of this stuff, I would just make sure to power it up with the Xtron switch. And if you don't, I think it would be completely safe to leave just a basic digital to analog converter plugged in at all the time, especially if it's a manual switch, because um, even if the HDMI to VGA converter is constantly sending a signal, that might would mess with an automatic switch depending on which switch and what port you're in. But with a manual switch, like you described, that wouldn't be an issue because you just don't select that port and they draw very, very little power. So it's not like you're going to be having a high power bill for leaving this thing in. It probably won't even be a noticeable difference. So I think it just, it could be one of those three things and any one of them, if it's solved by just leaving the power in, that's how I would do it. And in fact, the only time I ever really use an unpowered converter like that is for my time sleuth, just because I want something quick and easy. And even sometimes that doesn't work either, which I think has to do with the same situation, the direct displays I'm connecting it to and whatnot. So yeah, any of those cheap DACs that you see should be fine, but all of the ones I list, except the little pigtail one, um, all all have a power adapter with it or have like a USB port. So I strongly recommend using that just to kind of make sure that none of these issues happen again because you're already being fed power. Couple of questions from Jason Guffey. First, the OSSC gets a lot of praise for its ability to accept oddball signals and convert them, but how well does it work with 60 hertz signals, specifically for doubling 640 by 480 games on a retro PC to 1280 by 960 on a CRT monitor? Would there be any advantage to doing this at all? I've honestly never tried. Uh, I've, I've definitely digitized 640 by 480 through the OSSC, which works great. I've never tried line doubling that way. I don't imagine there would be any problems, but it's just a matter of, would you really have a benefit for this when using a CRT? One of the beautiful things about CRTs is that resolution doesn't matter. It's all about the refresh rate and stuff. So if that's an experiment that you would like to try, by all means, go for it. It's not going to hurt anything. Worst comes to worst, your CRT doesn't like it and you just turn it back to the other setting. But I don't know if there'd be any advantage to it. So that's one of those things where I would just give it a try and see. Now, of course, if you were using a flat panel, that might have the advantage of running it closer to its native resolution, so it would look sharper. But, you know, once again, it would, no matter what your setup is with that or what your target device, I would just try and see what happens because the worst that could happen is it doesn't work and just immediately flip it back so you're not sending an improper signal. Second, what is generally the consensus on projection TVs? No one really seems to talk about them in reference to quality CRTs or LCDs, so what the heck even are they? My family had one growing up, but I never got to play on it or interact with it much. Best guess, best guess at a glance is they have a decent chunk of digital processing, but I have no idea on them. I have no clue. I haven't even seen one in over 10 years. I would love to answer that question. The only thing that I remember, and this is so subjective, not fact at all. But the only thing that I remember is growing up, all the projection TVs, whether it was CRT or LCD, didn't look as good as all the other options. And I remember even seeing like a $10,000 Sony 70 inch DLP 1080i projection TV. Um, and then I saw, you know, like a, a nice 30 inch CRT next to it. And it was just, there was no comparison to which one was better. So, um, but that only means that the ones that I've personally seen 
weren't as good. I've only seen maybe 20 in my whole life, probably, where I actually sat down and watched. And the impression that I always got from back in the CRT projection TV days all the way up to the last was that they were designed for use in scenarios where you needed a bigger TV. You know, you're at a bar, you put a TV at the end of the bar so that everybody could see it. So uh, rather than a bunch of CRTs across it, situations like that. So I would love to see if they had lag. I'd love to see if there are models out there that you could tweak and they'll, they'll look amazing. They'll look just as good as a ceiling projector or something. I just have no idea. Um, and if anybody else has any thoughts on this, please chime in in the comments because I'm always interested in, in people's thoughts on this stuff. And it's totally plausible that there's amazing stuff out there that I just haven't seen. Um, Lastly, is there any software or tests you recommend equivalent to the 240p test suite, but for 16x9 or 1610x displays? Maybe like a 720p test suite. Something that works for a wide variety of displays would be preferred. They'd love to be able to make color and geometry adjustments for newer content as well as retro. So that's a good question, but the reason that doesn't exist in the gaming world is because that already exists in the home theater world. I don't know about 720p, but there's definitely 1080p stuff and there's definitely DVDs, so 480i, or you could probably find one that's meant to be deinterlaced to 480p. There's definitely those out there. Um, I don't know about 720p. If anybody has a link to one, I'd love to see it. I assume they're out there, but because these are standard video signals, so 480p, 480i, 720p, 1080p, 1080i, I guess even, they're there really isn't anything too special needed. Standard color patterns, standard geometry would all work on all of them. Whereas the 240p test suite outputs in the exact resolution and refresh rate of the analog console that you're using and each one are different. So I'm not like, discouraging you for, from, from using these or I'm certainly not you know being negative about your question. Just the answer that I believe the answer to do they have something like this for modern consoles is no, because you wouldn't need that. You would just take any standard home theater calibration disc and use it that way. And there's colorometers now that you could use. There's some that you could plug into a PC. I've seen a few that plug into the TVs themselves and you just sit it right in front and you come back in a couple hours. Uh, those were pretty expensive though. But so I, I'm, I'm pretty sure that's the answer to the question. Is it just, it's not a custom one isn't needed for video games. You would just treat it the same as video content, unlike 240p. So if anybody knows different, please chime in. I'm all ears, but I think that's a pretty safe assumption. The Remora had a question concerning TTL Sync. How many consoles output TTL Sync by default? It seems odd that all these RGB mods are designed with toggles if they used TTL originally. So I don't want to go too far down the rabbit hole. Uh, I have to just start out by saying if you're looking to purchase consoles for use with SCART switches or SCART devices, get good shielded cables, but just get sync on composite video or sync on Luma for things like the PlayStation and PlayStation 2. PlayStation 2, we'd probably benefit from component video just to make things easier, but no quality difference, just simplicity of setup. So... I guess I would always want to start with, unless you need to worry about this, don't. Just take the easy route and know that it's a good solution that may or may not have some advantages. Um, I talked about this a while back in a video I did. I'll try to leave links to all of this stuff, but a lot of consoles output TTL level sync, and it's never really the same because there was never really a standard decided upon for video games. So the SCART standard lists composite video as sync, which means just composite video sync uh, could be used in place of it, which is why we have things like that set up. But all of the TTL outputs were never really designed for anything. And in fact, unless I'm not remembering correctly, the only time an official device ever used it was the 32X because that took the sync from the sync pin in order to uh, to synchronize the two games together. You know, the stuff running on the Genesis layer and the stuff running on the 32X layer. So not the two games, the two layers. But um, so... That's kind of why it's so confusing is because every console is different and the main reason people wanted to use that as opposed to composite video was if your cables weren't properly shielded or for very specific scenarios like using an Xtron crosspoint. So 
To the other part of your question is, it seems odd that all these RGB mods are designed with toggles if they used TTL originally. I agree. I don't like that. I don't think that should be advertised. I think that confused more people than it helped. But when it first came out like that, the reason there was a setting was because a lot of people were just making their own custom cables and they had their own setups and they knew which signal they needed for their own personal setup. And I think I think it was wrong to do that, which I believe I supported this at first, but in hindsight, it was wrong because the type of person that says I have a specific setup that needs a specific voltage level of sync already knows what they need to do. You know, 99% of them would, whereas uh, the opposite, a noob coming in is going to say like, oh, I heard TTL is higher voltage. I don't want that. And then their SCART cable doesn't work because um, it drops the voltage too low in combining with their cable. So, uh, I think the reason they were the toggles were there were just for custom setups, but it's just better that they're not altogether. Just my opinion on that one. So that's pretty much it as far as TTL goes. If you don't want to deal with it, don't. Just get sync on composite video cables uh, or HD retrovision cables or sync on Luma and just don't ever worry about it. But if you're going into an Extron crosspoint, you need TTL sync because it can't accept any other signal through its sync input, which is funny because you could run composite video through them. You just have to not run it through the sync port. Um, you, you would have to use one of the RGB lines, which you can't do if you're running RGBS because you need all of those things. So that that's kind of the scenario that you have. Um, now, you also mentioned that you purchased a couple of Extron crosspoints. Um, you wanted to remind everybody that when you're purchasing, check the back to make sure there's audio inputs because a lot of these don't have them and some do. They're those blue connectors, the Phoenix connectors, I think they're called, uh, and you need adapters to get them to RCA audio or whatever else. So good tip to remind everybody. And also one of the ones the Remora picked up wasn't working and all of the caps, uh, the capacitors inside when they opened them up were swollen. So I mean, it's, it's expected, right? Any kind of electronic device that has capacitors in it, especially something that may have been in an industrial setup running 24 seven, you know, maybe a hot server room type of thing. Um, it's, it's, everything's going to need their capacitors replaced at some time between now and never. So all electronic devices, you're kind of going to have to worry about it. But I mean, it's the same thing with everything that's old, you know, old cars, old clothes, old art, everything has some kind of maintenance that's required to keep it going. It's just a matter of if it's important enough to you to, to go through it or to just get another solution. And it's my personal opinion that the cross points are awesome and if you know how to do a recap and you don't mind spending the time doing it it's totally worth it because you have a solid piece of equipment dylan brought their crt to a local repair shop to get the horizontal issues worked out but they just got off the phone with them and they're pretty sure it's a high voltage hstat convergence part by encompass that's no longer made do i have any idea where i might look for a part like this no you're going to have to scour the internet for it, but I think unless somebody like Retrotech, Steve from Retrotech, has any info on this, I think the only way to find parts like this is to try to find the same exact monitor that you know maybe has a dead tube or something like that and just buy it for parts and try to, to part it out like that. Um, you know, I'm, a lot of this stuff just isn't made anymore and there aren't really warehouses that have parts. So I think you just have to get lucky and try to find one. Um, you know, and most likely it's going to be in another one of these monitors that has a different dead part and you could try to have a couple to swap around. I know a lot of people were doing that with BVMs and PVMs to kind of take, you know, one dead one that had a good tube and two other ones with bad tubes and mix all the parts together and try to get one working. So that might have to be what you end up doing. But once again, if, if I'm wrong and there's stuff out there and, and you know about it, please comment and, and let everybody know. And I'll even pin the comment just to make sure, because I think it's going to be a problem that all of us run into. And some of the less popular monitors are going to be the hardest to fix just because there aren't many people with parts for them. Tony also wanted to chime in about Extron crosspoints requiring cap replacements and said that they were able to make a cap list for their exact model. So the wiki really is coming, I, I promise, I swear, and that's the exact type of info we need. So if you want to share stuff like that, hold on to the cap list, make sure that you get the exact model number uh, in, in type of your crosspoint. Um, you know, you said crosspoint ultra 124 HVA, maybe snap a picture of the front and back just so that people can verify it. And then once that's up, um, just 
everybody would be uh, would be able to get an account and post we're going to make try to make sure that the layout is pretty easy so that you know i don't know if it'd be under accessories or switches or something but we'll we'll get that worked out and as long i mean maybe i'm wrong about this but i feel like as long as the info is there if we need to reorganize in a couple months uh, and reflow the site as long as the info is still there and you know the url stays the same the navigation could change and, and evolve as time goes on so hopefully we'll be able to get that open soon enough and um, I'll, I'm obviously going to make a big deal about it when it's open uh, I'll even probably make a big deal about it when it's open for beta just because everybody's still invited it's just going to be more of a learning process for everybody including me skinny ass firebrand x wanted to chime in again about the 240p test suites monoscope and or linearity problems they will in fact work for calibrating the crt's linearity and it doesn't even matter which console you use here's why the linearity and monoscope patterns are based on the console's dot clock so the circles or the red squares in the monoscope pattern will be absolutely perfect for calibrating the crt that's the beauty of designing linearity and or monoscope patterns based on the console dot clock. It means that pattern is kosher to use for setting perfect circles or squares, no matter which resolution mode it uses. I did not know that. Thank you very much, FBX, for, for chiming in on that. And uh, not just for chiming in, but the way you explained it, it is pretty easy to understand as well. So I appreciate you taking the time to, to educate us. And so that's going to be my answer from now on is just get the linearity and monoscope pattern and calibrate it that way. And it doesn't really matter what console you have. It's probably whichever one is the easiest to plug in with an RGB or a component cable would be the right answer. Or I guess VGA in the case of Dreamcast, but you know what I mean. Adam W. has a Model 1 Sega Genesis with the Triple Bypass version 2 installed, and the PSG-based sound channel recently became very low in volume, and the FM-based sounds are way louder to the point that they drown out the PSG sounds altogether. So that's a very interesting problem to troubleshoot, because if you're saying that it didn't happen before and it happened now, that, that's the confusing part. If you had one installed last year and it was always like that, I would say if somebody hand built them, there's a chance that the, they put a wrong part on. If you got it from somebody that did a large manufacturing run, there's always the very small chance that one or two of them had a, a part swapped. But usually with stuff like that, you know, if one was bad, they'd all be bad and they, everybody would know right away. It's still not, you know, not impossible, but the fact that it was working fine and then the sound dropped is the interesting thing. It could be um, maybe the wiring, maybe uh, if you had shifted it around or if you moved or if the console got shipped, maybe the wiring was sort of kind of breaking off and now it's losing connection. Maybe one of the resistors, something happened to it. Um, that's, that's a really hard one to troubleshoot. So I would pop it open and first do a physical check. Very, very carefully look to see that all the wires are connected. Um, use a magnifying glass and look at the board and see if any components are coming off. Please remember though that whenever you look at small surface mount components with a macro lens or a magnifying glass, you see every little imperfection and it's gonna at first be like, wow, is this thing built wrong? And you just have to understand when you zoom in that deep, you see everything so just try to get a basic sense and even if you don't really know what you're looking at you know like you don't follow circuits or anything like that you could still just have a physical inspection of it you know like i remember as i'm getting off topic here but i remember when i was a kid uh, a friend of mine was selling a car and i brought another friend who wanted the same thing and he opens up the hood and he's looking and i, I kind of elbowed the guy selling the car like the hell is he looking at he doesn't know anything about cars and i went up and he was a friend so i just asked what the hell are you looking at <laughs> you don't know anything in here and he goes you're right but i wanted to see if something jumped out at me is there a mouse nest you know is a wire falling off is something else i might not know how an engine works but if something pops out it's worth asking about and i laughed because he was 100 percent true or 100 percent right uh and I feel like that's the same scenario. So uh, whether you know everything about designing circuits or whether you know nothing about it, just do a physical inspection and see if there's something that jumps out at you. A resistor that's half off of a pad or something like that. Something that um, that's pulled up. If it looks like components are missing, that's normal because the way the triple bypass version 2 was designed was that one board could handle many consoles. But that's another thing to look at is are the jumpers set right? Did, did somebody use a wire to jump the things together and the wire popped off? 
So uh, I'm going to stop rambling because I'm basically just telling you take a look and see what you think. Um, but I would send pictures to your modder and maybe go to any of the discords where people do Genesis modding or, or I guess forums or something and, and share those pictures and see if anything stands out. Matt Coons wanted to follow up with the discussion about converting component video to S video for the purpose of taking a component video signal and sending it to both a TV with component video inputs and one that only has S video inputs. And my suggestion was, if you can't figure this out, just use S video for both. It might not be the biggest difference, but you could try if you have the budget buying another adapter and that's exactly what Matt did and it seemed to work. So it looks like everything is run component video and then one of the outputs of the component video goes through the comp to RGB from, from RetroTank and then that goes into the Ashenworks RGB to YC which then outputs S video. So I had discussed that, but I was afraid that maybe with two signal converters in the chain, something might go nuts or you might get color issues, but apparently it works fine and provides a very nice picture on their S video CRT. So if you have that kind of setup and you want component video on one and S video on another, that would apparently work. It'd be a little costly because you're going to buy two devices. Um, but I think that's a really cool thing to know because there's definitely a scenario in which you might have found a 14 inch PVM that you could run RGB or component video to. And let's say you got that 14 inch uh, monitor, you have a bunch of HD retrovision cables, so you're already running a full component solution, but then you want to also have a giant 32 inch TV just for whenever it's fun to play on a bigger screen. Maybe not the same quality as a PVM, but sometimes it's just fun to do that. And if it's limited to S video, this would be a really great option. So just getting any of the RGB to S video converters that are out there would work, but now you know that you could also go component to RGB to S video. So thank you very much, Matt, for doing that experiment for us. I'm glad it worked out and I'll remember that if I need to give that advice at all in the future. Rick Lewis said on this week's roundup, I gushed about how great the 240p test suite is and they just don't understand what it is and its purpose. They're using a consumer CRT with composite inputs and a FrameMeister with Firebrand access settings to a modern TV. Are there uses in my scenarios where I would get a benefit from the test suite? Um, yes and no. So in the context of the FrameMeister, probably not. I would just use FBX's settings and they're probably, it probably already is a great experience. But with your consumer CRT, it depends on how many controls are available easily to you. So on the flip side, if you had something like a BVM, let's just say, that has you know a remote control unit that allows you to have access to all the settings, I would take the 240p test suite and I would calibrate geometry at the very least um, horizontal and vertical. So you know you could make sure it fills the screen top to bottom, left to right, and if you had the ability to do more geometry stuff, cool. But the very least, you could center the image properly. Or you could then open up the color bar pattern and try to calibrate the colors. Uh, and you could really go through all of the different settings to try to enhance your TV and tweak it as best as you could. But with a consumer CRT, it's a lot more complicated. Sometimes you could use service menus. Sometimes things are available right in the main menu, but other times you have to open it up and you have to mess with dials on the inside. Some you don't even have controls at all. Sometimes you gotta use convergence strips and stuff like that. So if that's the case, I, I don't know if I would bother, although I would take the time to center the image. You know, even if it's a bit of a pain, I would do that just to make sure that there isn't, you're not seeing a ton of overscan area or vice versa if you're not cutting off too much of the image by doing that. So in, in your scenario, I don't know if it's really a huge benefit to you, but anybody who tests and makes new products, it is. And I don't want to go down that rabbit hole because I'll probably talk for an hour, but if you ever were testing a brand new product and you wanted to, to test its quality, if you were putting something on an oscilloscope and you needed a 100% color bar pattern, uh, if you want to test scrolling to see if your geometry looks good when scrolling vertical or horizontal, lag tests with a slow motion camera, um, you know, there's a lot of cool features in there. For, uh, 240p 480i test that you could test to make sure that your processor on a digital TV, so flat panel TV, capture card, you have a very easy way to tell if the TV is processing 240p correctly or if it's being processed as 480i. So there's a long list of stuff it could do, but in your specific scenario, probably not. 
Um, Bowie also wanted to chime in and say they managed to use one of the Simpty color bar patterns with their TV's automatic calibration tool, but they think they chose the wrong intensity or something. Do I have any idea how to use those bars to calibrate LCD panels or to fix your mistake? Um, generally speaking, I would try to set, if it's, I'm not talking about a BVM or a PVM, if you're just talking about a standard LCD TV, I would look for any factory reset settings. Um, it's not going to be that big a deal. Whereas if you factory reset a BVM, it could look, I mean, you could really m mess up all of the calibration settings. Whereas unless you've already spent hours and hours and hours tweaking your LCD, which most people don't respectfully, um, then I, I would just try to find a factory reset, do a firmware update and start from scratch. Quantum Guitar was wondering if I had any advice for strain relief solutions for a setup that includes a retro gaming cables SNES cable to a RetroTINK 2X SCART. They feel like the cables keep slipping out a bit on both ends, and they've seen printed solutions for the prism and the carby that seem pretty cool. So do I think something like this is necessary, and do I address similar problems with my setups? Um, that never happens on my setup. But I think it would all have to do with mounting. And one of the things that I showed in the SCART coupler video was how I very often will plug a RetroTINK device or an OSSC onto the SCART coupler into my G-SCART switch. And if I loop the cable around, there's no strain relief needed. It doesn't put any pressure on the SCART pins and everything just stays in place perfectly. But if I were to like wiggle the cable around, everything would probably pop out. And I think that's a, a neat visualization because I think it all depends on where your setup's mounted, uh, where the strain relief is on the cables and stuff like that. But for example, if I'm just setting it all on a table like I often do for these videos, the cable never pops out of the Super Nintendo or or N64 or the 2X cart. So I would really just, I would look for any kind of strain relief where you could take the pressure off the connector ends. And that might be as simple as slightly moving where you have everything stored so that it's not being tugged on. Or it might be something like you put one of those zip tie sticky tape things on your table, put a zip tie in it, and then tie it down so that it holds it in place so there's no pressure on the multi-out, but if somebody tugs the other side of the cable, it doesn't move. And I guess you would need one on both ends or something like that. So yeah, it's, and, and for whatever reason, if it, even doing that, it does keep popping out. There could be a small chance that the SCART head on the cable isn't working right. And, and an even smaller chance that the receptacle port on the Retro Tink 2X SCART is worn down even though it's brand new or something like that. I mean, it's not impossible, especially when you're ordering things that are made in such large quantities like those SCART heads. Maybe one out of 10,000 gets made badly or something like that. But I would just start with, with basic stuff and see if that works and then kind of troubleshoot from there on. Bowie wants to know if plugging and unplugging an RCA cable multiple times could damage the plug or the jack or even the PCB the jacks are soldered on. Yes and no. Anytime you have two physical connections and any kind of friction connection like that, every time that you plug it in and unplug it, it wears on the microscopic level. So technically speaking, um, yes, you're damaging it every time you plug it in, but damaging should be in quotes there because it's like it's normal wear and tear and they're designed to have quite a few of those. The only issue is when you have things like, or the only real concern, I guess I should say, is when you have something like monster cables that have those death grips. So plugging them on puts a lot of strain on both the PCB and the connector. And when you're taking them out, it's the same thing. It's pulling hard on the PCB. And I've seen plenty of RCA jacks break. I don't think I've ever seen a PCB break, but I've seen the RCA jacks break off with those cables with the death grips. And the truth is, you don't need a death grip to get a good signal. You just need a consistent grip. So I guess the best advice would be, like, just make sure you're not using cables that are crimped too hard. But, you know, even if you're doing something like you don't have a switch yet, so you're plugging in each console one at a time whenever you're using it, and you're constantly switching back before back and forth between cables, I wouldn't really worry about that. Yes, at some time between now and never, you're going to wear those out, um, but it might be, it might take longer than we are alive, and if it doesn't, you could just do something like maybe crimp the, the plug end of the cable down a little bit harder, and maybe you might need to eventually replace the receptacle on the PCB, but 
overall, as long as you don't use cables with death grips, you should be okay. I just would, you know, just like everything else, avoid any unnecessary stress on it. But normal wear and tear, I think you would be fine for a pretty long period of time. Cam has an interesting scenario. They want to display still picture pixel art on a Sony BVM CRT monitor, and then they want to take high quality pictures of the monitor with the art on it. And this is definitely a doable solution with the equipment that you've listed, but I'm going to give a more general answer in case everybody else wants to know about this. First, if your BVM is a D series or an A series and it accepts uh, 480p input, not just 15 kilohertz signals, all you would need to do is take the output of your laptop uh, and go from an HDMI to component video converter, set your laptop's secondary video output to 640 by 480, and that's it. You go right into your BVM and it would work. You wouldn't get the 240p look to it though, but you would absolutely get the image to be displayed. But assuming that your BVM is 15 kilohertz only or that you really want the 240p look, you would need two DACs and the Retro Tink 5X, which you already own. Any downscaling solution would work. The Tink 5X is the best one at the moment, so perfect. But you would do the same thing, but you would need two DACs. So HDMI out of your laptop into this converter. Uh, once you go into this converter, you make sure to once again, set it to 640 by 480 into the Retro Tink 5X, set that to 240p downscaling mode and then take another HDMI to component converter from the RetroTank 5X's output and plug that into your BVM. And you would then definitely be able to get the full image in a 240p look with the standard scan lines. And the only thing you would have to worry about is how the downscaling affects your image. Remember to use the up and down arrow on the RetroTank 5X's remote to center it. You might need to make some changes to the image, but overall I would basically just watch the RetroTank 5X deep dive video I did and check out the downscaling section for more info on that. Uh, but that would absolutely work. There are other ways to do it, especially because you don't need to worry about lag uh, because it's a still image. But the other cheaper ways, uh, cheaper if you don't already own the RetroTank 5X, those would downscale it most likely to 480i, which would totally change the look. If that's what you're going for, cool. But um, since you already own the RetroTank 5X, picking up two cheap DACs would not only solve this problem for you, but I guarantee if you're a nerd and a tinkerer like me, at some other point in your life, you're going to use those for something else and you're going to be happy that you spent the 20 bucks on it anyway. So... Uh, that should be fine for your experiment. As far as taking pictures, taking still pictures is just something that you could mess around with and choose what ends up looking best to your eyes. It's not too bad. It's a little bit tedious, but if you if you know any kind of manual settings on a camera, you're not even necessarily pro settings, just know, you know how to manually set your camera. Try different things. Um, try really low ISO settings, which is the lowest ISO setting your camera can handle. Even a phone would be the best way to do it. Um, and then just try different exposure times. So, and uh, also you wanna, if possible, use a color calibrator thingy. Um, I use this for all of my videos. I think it's like 10 bucks, but you basically just hold this up in front of the camera and then you calibrate using that and then that should be it. So that would keep the colors correct. Um, you would wanna do that in normal lighting in the room, not necessarily directly on the CRT or anything like that. Um, and that's pretty much it. So focus, uh, exposure time, color calibration, and low ISO is probably the only things that you would need to mess with. And then also mess with the f-stop to see how that affects the image. Uh, depending on exposure time and everything else, I've tried both a high f-stop and a long exposure time and vice versa. And at the end of the day, whatever looks on that picture closest to how your eyes see it is the winner. Um, you could do a bunch of different experimentation. You could even do things like you take a picture that comes out okay, but then you put it in Photoshop and mess with the lighting a little bit. As long as it's accurate to what your eyes see, it's a total win. So hopefully that puts you, or that puts it into perspective for your experiment. Um, and if it's something you're willing to share, please post it here and I'll share it with everybody because I like stuff like that. One last question from Cam. They want to know if there's a good way to get the output from an unmodified N64 into a GSCART switch. 
Their setup is all of their consoles going into the GSCART switch, so I'm assuming they're all RGB SCART and you don't have any mixed setup, because you're then going into a BVM from one of the GSCART's outputs and the RetroTINK 5X from the other, which means the TINK 5X can only accept RGB through the SCART port, so you're talking you would have to get your N64 to RGB SCART in order to make the setup converted into something you could just plug into. And I think there's a few converters that you might be able to get. You could probably buy the um, S-Video to component video converter called the Core U Transcoder. And then you could get a, uh, the Comp to RGB from uh, Mike Chi, the RetroTINK device. Or you could pay somebody to mod your N64 to output RGB that I think would be cheaper than those two devices combined and be less of a hassle overall. If you have an older N64, you could have a drop-in RGB modded board that only requires three or four wires, depending on which cable you choose, and that's cheap and fairly easy, even for beginners. If you're a beginner, definitely practice on something else first, then do it just for the heck of it, but overall, it's a pretty easy solution, and those boards are cheaper than either one of those devices. So... Is there a good way to get the output from an unmodified N64 into a GSCART switch? In a perfect world, there would be a cable that just has an S-Video to RGB converter in it that would allow you to skip all of that, but that doesn't exist. So I think in your specific setup, with everything RGB going into two very awesome devices, you might as well just get an RGB mod one way or another. And if you're lucky, you could have an N64 model with the easy RGB mod, so it's not even that much work or cost involved in it. Alex S. wants to know, for the Nintendo 64, is it worth upgrading from composite video to S-Video on a CRT? And my answer to that completely has to do with what setup you have and what you already own. So let's say, hypothetically, you already have a Nintendo 64 and you have any CRT, consumer grade, PVM, whatever, that already has composite and S-Video inputs. I would just buy a decent quality cable and see for yourself, as long as budget allows. The only thing I would say is don't get a cheap AliExpress cable to run this uh, experiment because if you buy the wrong cable, it'll look identical anyway and it totally defeats the purpose. So if you're curious and you already have everything except the cable, get either retro gaming cables or Insurrection Industries or there's a few others. I'll leave a link in the description to the main page to scroll down for the S-Video cable link. And I would give it a try and see for yourself. Um, you know, if you don't like it, or if you don't care, or if it's not that big a deal, you could always use that for a Super Nintendo, or for a GameCube if your monitor is 15 kilohertz only. You know, it's not something that I think in most cases would go to waste, so it's worth spending the money to do the experiment. But on the flip side, if you're just getting into all of this stuff, and you don't own any of the equipment yet, or you're connecting into a TV that only has composite video inputs, and you would need to find a new TV or a new input card or whatever else to get S-Video, I wouldn't. And that's just my opinion, because the N64's 3D graphics mixed with the very clean composite video signal blends very well on a CRT. And I always make the point that as much as I love the N64 digital and I love all of the different things that you could do going onto a flat panel, if you want a great Nintendo 64 experience, a stock console with the cables that it came with, that yellow cable going into any CRT, any CRT that works, is an excellent experience. And I don't think you need anything else. And in the case of like, the Super Nintendo and Genesis, one might even argue that composite video would allow for blending for certain screen effects like the Waterfall and Sonic and stuff like that. But even with that, if you had the ability on those 16-bit consoles to go to a sharper signal, so it would be S-Video on a uh, Super Nintendo or it would be either RGB or component via HD Retrovision on the Genesis, if you had the ability to do that, for those, I would strongly recommend it because I do feel like so many of those games just look gorgeous with the sharpness that you get from S-Video. Uh, and especially in the case of the Genesis, it's composite video is pretty noisy. So I feel like that output would be very beneficial, even though you lose some of the uh, transparency blending of the Genesis. And even stuff like the Saturn, depending on which games you play. But 
for the N64 and even for the PlayStation 1, or I guess even 3D Saturn games and stuff like that, composite video is a great solution. It blends together those 3D graphics nicely, and it's exactly what the original creators of those games were testing on when they made them. So um, I, I hope that wasn't too long and rambly a response, but every time I talk about composites fine on an N64, I just, for some crazy reason, get piled on by trolls saying like, Bob's lying. He always says go RGB, but he's trying to sell composite cable. I don't know. I don't know what the trolls talk about. I don't really, I try not to pay attention, but I do want to just make sure my, my answer is clear because I don't want both you and everybody else listening to put that into perspective. Grab any N64 and any working CRT and plug it in with composite and it's awesome. If the CRT also has S video, buy a nice cable and give it a shot. And you might say, oh, I love the the sharpness and I love the way the colors look. You know, I, I'll take the lack of blending. Or you might say, eh, it's about the same. You know, one, one of them looks better one way, one's the other. Or if you're half blind, you won't be able to tell the difference. <laughs> Just kidding. Just kidding. But uh, yeah, hopefully that was a good, that was a good perspective on that. Well, that's it for this week. If you're new to these Q&As, please post any question you have in any support service that you're signed up for. Just make sure that you post in the newest post. The way these things work, I can't tell what a new question is on an old post, and I really enjoy just scrolling through in real time. So that's the only thing is wherever you support, post in the newest post there. And if for whatever reason I don't get to it, that either came in after I started recording or I accidentally deleted a file in post or something like that. So either re-ask the next week or just message me directly if it's something time sensitive. But as always, thanks to everybody who participates in these. I have a great time doing them and I hope you all at least a little bit enjoy it. Um, and thanks of course to anybody who just listens and, and wants to enjoy it and doesn't have the ability to support. I still appreciate you too. So thank you all very much and I'll see you next week.